We come to you this morning. All of us are so different, but we all have needs that you can meet. We pray, Lord, that, that the Spirit of God will be with our pastor and be with us, that we might learn your word and grow in you and give us uh, the love of Christ that we might be a blessing to each other, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Let's sing an opening chorus before our prayer time. It's 857. 857, remain seated as we sing. Jesus has accomplished for us down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to His name. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. We'll continue in worshiping, singing on to the Lord. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where we were from sin I cried.
and the grace that will keep us through eternity. Lord, we rejoice in thee, and we thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
so thankful for the hope we have in the Lord.
Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 1. <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I'll read it again. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord had a blessing in the reading of his word this morning. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you today that we can be gathered in this Lord's Day morning to have your word opened. And we pray, Father, as we have sung hymns of praise and worship, we've heard your word read. Father, we thank you that your word speaks to us by the Spirit of God. And Lord, we thank you for these lovely hymns that have truth and, and meat in them that speak of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus and of the wonderful salvation we have in him. And Father, uh, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's uh, blood? And you think of the precious blood of Christ and the love of Christ that's been extended toward us. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And we thank thee, Lord, that the Lord Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again the third day. We thank thee, Lord, that we have your word before us to instruct us, to correct us, to help us in this walk the pilgrimage, the Christian life. And we know that knowing Christ as our Savior means that we're on a journey, and that journey will one day lead to glory. And we thank you for the blessed hope we have in Christ. And Lord, we pray that as we journey on this road, that you would guide us, that you would help our feet and our steps, direct our paths. And Father, we pray that as the Scriptures speak to our hearts today that we would be changed as a result of being gathered here this morning. We pray, Father, for each need that's here today. You know each and every heart, and you know each and every hurt. And Father, you know each difficulty that each one in each family is facing today. And so we pray that you would minister by the Spirit of God as you see fit. And Lord, we just thank you for how you know us better than we even know ourselves. You know just what we need at just the right time and just... You have the right grace for every need. And so we thank you for your wonderful, matchless grace, the marvelous grace of Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would just guide us now in the study of thy word, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible has much to say about our walk. The book of Ephesians alone, the word walk is found a number of times. If you go back to chapter 2 and verse number 2, we find it here. It says, wherein in time past... Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In, in uh, verse 10 of chapter 2, we find it again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. If you go over to chapter 4 and verse number 17, it says this, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. And then we find it again in chapter 5 and verse 2. It says, And walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And then again in verse 15, it says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. A number of times we find the word walk in the book of Ephesians, and it is found here <coughs> in verse 1 of chapter 4, that it says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy, of the vocation where which ye, wherewith ye are called. If you and I were to go into a shoe store, we would find that there are all manner of types of shoes. 
There are shoes for exercise. There are shoes for working. There are shoes for hiking. There are shoes for formal wear. There are shoes for casual wear. There are shoes that you can even get for swimming. So water shoes. All kinds of shoes. Now if you can imagine going into a shoe store and saying, I need a shoe to work in the yard and then maybe cut grass because the grass is growing and maybe we need a pair of shoes for that. And the clerk was to say, well, let me just go find something. And the clerk comes back with a pair of flip-flops and says, now here's a shoe for you. I'd be looking at them and thinking, um, thank you for your time. I'll go back and <laughs> look myself. Uh, because we know flip-flops just start out the, that's the wrong shoe for the job, isn't it? Wrong shoe for the job. And uh, this isn't a, 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 you know, a service announcement, but don't wear open-toed shoes when you're cutting grass. That's, that's something my mother taught me <laughs> when I would grab the sandals and want to go out and cut the grass. No, you don't wear sandals when you're cutting the grass. And there's a reason why you don't wear sandals when you're cutting the grass. They have those emergency levers on the lawnmower now in case you let go and they automatically shut off because, boy, it can be very dangerous in ditches and other places. And so we have different shoes for different jobs. And just as it, as it is important to have right footwear for the task at hand, so too spiritually we need to be rightly equipped for the walk that the Lord would have for us. We need to be rightly equipped for the walk that the Lord would have for us. And there is a walk that we've been called to. In, in the book of Ephesians, it's mentioned a number of times, and I want to focus in in chapter 4, and we want to look at these various characteristics one by one. We're going to look at the first one this morning. But the Apostle Paul writing, he says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Notice he wasn't ashamed of where he was. He wasn't ashamed of his chains. He was in prison, but not for crimes against another, but he was in prison for being a faithful teacher and preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even in prison, the Lord was using Paul in winning souls to Christ and writing down the very word of God. Many of the epistles were written while the apostle Paul was in prison. And here in verse number one, he directs the believer toward his or toward her walk in the Lord. And he says, I beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Walking worthy speaks of living in a way that is pleasing and honoring to the Lord in light of the great and tremendous calling that is upon us as believers. Vocation is a word which means a great or a, a, a great calling, a great invitation. And we have been given a great calling into the kingdom of God. And so, walking worthy, reminding ourselves that we're not citizens of this earth, but we are citizens of heaven. We are heirs with Christ. We are the bride of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And we have been washed with the precious blood of Christ. And so when he calls the Christians here, and this is chapter 4, is really the transition period, a transition chapter in the book of Ephesians, which goes from doctrinal teaching in, uh, in the first three chapters, then to living it out, practical teaching of how we are to carry that out in our lives. And so he says that we are to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. And there is a life that is... Uh, consistent with such a holy calling that is upon us. If you go over to chapter 1 and verse number 9 of the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Notice what it says here. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with, with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's a great outline in that verse as well. Walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 
And it, it goes on, and it's one of those passages that it's hard to find a period because the, it just continues and continues. But he is building on the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ has washed us, our sins are forgiven, we are redeemed in him. And uh, he is above all things, and he is the head of the church, but, but that we are to walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing. We are to walk in a way that's pleasing in his sight. And that ought to be our sincerest desire in the Christian life, ought to be to please the Lord. And if that's not our sincerest desire today, then there's a problem inside our hearts. And the Lord wants to address that because the worst place for us to be as a Christian is to be in a place where we're not desiring to please the Lord. We're, gonna, we're not going to have a joy or the joy of our salvation won't be there. We won't, we won't be living for the Lord and, and witnessing His blessings around us. We won't be as we were studying on our Wednesday night and the, in Joshua. And the, he was anticipating God to work. He was anticipating the blessing of God. And Joshua said, tomorrow ye shall see the Lord do wondrous things among you. The Lord will do wondrous things to, among you tomorrow. And Joshua was anticipating the moving of God. And how many times in our lives we just kind of go from day to day and we're not expecting God to work and we're not watching for His hand and His leading and His guiding in our lives. And so we need to be in a place in our hearts where our desire is to please the Lord. And when our desire is to please God and please the Lord Jesus Christ, it will affect every area of our lives. Well, it won't just affect some of the areas. It'll, it'll, it'll affect all the areas of our lives. You know, that's how the Lord wants to work. That's how He wants to lead and guide us. He wants to change us. He wants us to be changed in every area of our life. And He does that little by little, step by step, as we walk with Him. And so the great need we all have is to walk in a way that pleases the Lord. And we need to have, then, shoes. The right shoes for that walk. And if we could find a pair of shoes, some spiritual shoes that we could wear... For that walk, the spiritual shoes that we need to put on then is Christ likeness. Christ likeness. What are Christ shoes like? Notice we find the character of the Lord Jesus Christ here in chapter 4 of Ephesians in verse 2. He doesn't just tell us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called and figure it out on your own. But notice he gives us very clear direction. This is how we're to walk. With all lowliness and meekness, with a long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We will not find ourselves walking uh, that, that road with, our, with the, the, the old natural shoes on, of the natural man that does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. We won't, we won't find ourselves walking this road with the, with the shoes of our old nature, which are going to want to cause us to walk in a way contrary to this passage. But when Christ, when we have known Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and we have surrendered our lives and say, Lord, I want to please you with every area of my life, and He's going to come alongside of us, He's going to say to us, that if we're going to please Him, we need to have these attributes flowing through us. Loneliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I would like for us to examine then these qualities and that the Lord would help us to walk worthy of our calling by His grace. And the first quality we find here is that of lowliness. Lowliness is a word which refers to genuine humility. It's a humility that comes from our association with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. One writes concerning lowliness. Lowliness, not loneliness, lowliness, <laughs> makes us conscious of our own nothingness and enables us to esteem others better than ourselves. It is the opposite of conceit and arrogance. Lowliness. The life of lowliness is not one that comes naturally to us because our hearts have been altered by sin. Our old nature looks to put ourselves above others rather than esteeming others better than ourselves. Our old nature looks to put others down by our words and by our actions, by our thoughts. 
Walking worthy means that we need to walk the road of lowliness. And there's no greater example of one who walked that perfect road than the Lord Jesus himself. And if we take our Bibles and turn back to John's Gospel, chapter 13, one of the ways in which this can be seen in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus, this walk of lowliness was the servant's heart that he had. The servant's heart was one that is willing to go out of his way for others without asking for anything in return. And this was witnessed whenever Jesus or wherever Jesus went. He was always helping others. He was always prepared to serve. And he left us an example. And in John chapter 13, we view the lowliness of Christ. And the Lord Jesus takes a lowly place in this passage and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And I'll start in verse 1 and it says this, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter answered and saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, ye are not all clean. Jesus knew that his hour had come. What hour was that? It was the hour coming where he was going to go to the cross. He was going to suffer and he was going to die for our sins on the tree. And there is no greater loneliness than what the Lord Jesus endured on the cross. And that the scripture said that he was made sin for us who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When we think of esteeming others better than ourselves. Christ esteemed others better than himself. Philippians 2 tells us that he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. And the scripture says here that the supper had ended. And in verse number 4 it says he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Now this one little verse has a, a message in it. Because when we think of lowliness, the Lord Jesus took his own garments and he laid them aside and he put on the servant's garment. And he was prepared to wash the disciples' feet. And you know there's a spiritual sense in which the Lord Jesus left the heavenly place he left the glories of heaven. He laid aside his glory and took upon himself. He veiled himself in a body of humanity, yet without sin. He veiled himself in a body of flesh and blood, yet without sin. And he walked among the, uh, the road of life. He walked the humble road. He walked the lowly road. And in what he did in taking himself upon, taking upon himself humanity as he was putting that servant's garb on as it were. He was putting on the servant's towel and he was going out to serve others. Lowliness. Humility. He was the king of kings and yet he was, he humbled himself so much for us. And so he rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And Jesus mentions, it mentions to us here that Judas Iscariot is also there. And Jesus begins to wash their feet. And he comes to Simon Peter. And Peter questions him, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Dost thou wash my feet? 
He questions him. Here is Jesus, and he is going to get on the ground, and he's going to wash our feet. And Peter says, no. What Jesus says, what I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter saith unto him, thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Peter was reluctant to have Jesus wash his feet. Peter was reluctant to allow Jesus, the Son of God, to come and go to such a dirty job as to wash his feet. And you know, today there is a danger of us forgetting that even though, yes, the Lord Jesus is so holy and he's so pure and he's so lovely, we can forget that he wants to work in our hearts and we can hesitate at times to allow the Spirit of God to work in us because we may feel as Peter did, that, oh, you're not going to wash my feet, Lord. You're not going to bow down lower than me and wash my feet. And you know, that's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to come in and He wants to cleanse us from our sin. He wants to see those dirty parts of us that no one else sees. And He sees the hearts and He knows our hearts and He knows our temptations and He knows our sins and He loves us. And we need to be like Peter that says we need to be after Peter was so eager at that point. He said, no, Lord, just wash my, my not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And, and the Lord Jesus was teaching him he was just in need of cleansing, not for a, a full wash. And, and we're so thankful that we came to the cross and we received Jesus as our Savior. Regeneration took place at that moment. That means that we were born again by the Spirit of God. And then as a Christian, we continually come for cleansing. We continually come for cleansing, that that fellowship might be restored, not that we lose our salvation, but that we would have that unhindered fellowship and walk with the Lord as we're to walk the lowly path. And Jesus is teaching them something here. And the washing of the disciples' feet was going to be a lesson to the apostles because Jesus was going to go to the cross, he was going to die, he was going to rise on the third day, and soon after that he was going to ascend into glory, and the apostles were going to go out the day of Pentecost, the, the Spirit of God was going to come upon them, and they were going to go out and they were going to preach and they were going to teach, and they were to go out and, and be the examples of Christ to others. And what was that going to look like? Notice in verse 12, so after he had washed their feet he, and had taken his garments and was set down again, he saith unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. What is Jesus saying here to them? He's saying that if the Lord and Master will bow down and wash their feet, then they are to go out and to serve. And there is no job, there is no task that is too low for them to be able to Take because they're to be reminded of that upper room and how Jesus took a towel upon himself and he served. Jesus had a servant's heart. And that's what he wants for each and every one of us as Christians. When we talk about walking worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. Walking, the worthy walk is the walk of lowliness. It's the walk of having a servant's heart. It's the walk of looking to Jesus and seeing the example that he left for us and that he left for them. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You know what the devil does today? His response is that job is too low for you. You can't go and sweep the floor. You can't go and take out the trash. That job is just too low for you. What does he do? He wants those old strings of pride. Pulls on those old temptation strings. Whereas Christ says there is no job too low. And we be thankful that we can serve. And uh, Christ is the perfect example because he went, to the, he, was the, he went to the lowliest place for us. 
as we think of him just leaving heaven alone and coming down to this world cursed with sin. You know, when he made the world, and what a miracle it was, of the creation. And he said, it is very good. He was so pleased with his creation. And then we see just how sin has caused great ruin upon his creation and upon our hearts and upon man. And, and God would see that from above and time and time he would bring judgment upon it. But now in this time he came as a man and he lived among men. What a lowly place. Jesus didn't come and live in the Garden of Eden where everything was just perfect prior to the fall. No, he came and he lived among sinners. And he was helping those that were afflicted. And he was helping those that were mourning. And he was comforting the hearts. And he was teaching people that they need to turn to him. And he was showing sinners that Jesus is the answer. That he was the answer. And he was leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. There is no job too low. Because Christ is has, has gone all the way for us. There's no question that Jesus was calling them to walk the lowly road. James chapter 4 reminds us of the great battle happening in our hearts. If you turn there for just a moment. James chapter 4. And this whole chapter is one that is a chapter that calls us to humility. Lowliness. And he says in verse 1, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, and ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye might consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is en enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your heart, hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Notice verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace Onto the humble, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. These are words that the devil does not want the Christian to be putting into practice today. <coughs> Humbling ourselves, submitting ourselves, resisting the devil, and he will flee from you. Drawing nigh to God, cleansing our hands, ye sinners, purifying our hearts, ye double minded, being afflicted and mourn. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness, being became concerned over our sin, saying, Lord, humble me. Lord, deal with my sin in my heart. Lord, cleanse me. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. And Satan says, no, I'll lift you up. The devil will give us things in this world, the pleasures of this life, and he'll just kind of put us on one pedestal or another, and it won't hold us. It won't bring true, true joy or satisfaction. What a reminder it is. That friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And so who is our friend today? And may the Lord help us as we think about what shoes are we wearing? What shoes are we wearing? Are we, walk, are we wearing the shoes of loneliness? That's where Christ would have us wear. Walking worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness. And we can't turn anywhere else in many places we could turn, but, but none other perfect example than the Lord Jesus Christ himself may help us to walk lowly this week.
May the Lord help us to, to be submitted before him, that we would draw close to the Lord, and that we would have a spirit of humility that only he can bring as a result of his working in our hearts by the spirit of God. My own nothingness in his greatness. And may we go from this place giving him the glory today. Let's bow together. Father, we pray this morning as we have looked at the example of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, laying aside his own garment and taking a towel and beginning to wash the disciples' feet. We see that example of loneliness. We see that example of humility. And Father, so many times in our lives, we see a task and we see, oh, that's, we could never do that. Or we're, we're above that. Father, help us to be submitted to whatever you're calling us to in our lives. Help us to be submitted to Thee. And You'll work out all the rest. Lord, we know the devil is doing his very best in this wicked world in which we live. A world that is an enemy of God. Help us not to love the world. Nor the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's so much that would draw us. Lord, we pray that you would guard our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would, there would be a submission upon each one of us as we come before thee. And Father, that you would help us to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called with all lowliness. Father, we know the Apostle Paul, he didn't complain in his time in prison. But he gave thanks to God and he used that time for your glory. Help us to use the time you've given us to bring glory to thee. We pray, Father, this morning, whatever the heart's need is today, if it's a need to receive Jesus Christ as personal Savior, that that individual would come and they would receive Christ as Savior today. That they would look to the cross, seeing that Jesus died for them, was buried and rose again, and that by faith alone they turn and they receive him as their Savior. We thank you, Lord, for all the testimonies of salvation in this room today. And Father, as a Christian, we pray that you would help us to live for thee, to walk worthy, to be reminded of the shoes that you've called us to wear by thy grace. And Father, we pray that you would cause us to go from this place rejoicing in thee, giving thanks for what you have accomplished and giving, having hope and anticipation of what you're going to do. For we just give thee thanks and praise this morning. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. I'm going to invite you to take your songbooks, and we're going to close to a closing hymn number 470. And this is the hymn that says, Living for Jesus, 470. And that's the life, that's the best life for us. And that's the only life for us. It's the life in which we live for Jesus. I'll live for him who died for me, how happy then my life shall be, the hymn writer says. And this one says, my life I give henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. I'll invite you to stand as we prayerfully sing this, where the Spirit of God may be speaking to our hearts this morning. This is an opportunity to respond to his leading. 470. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad hearted and free. This is the pathway. Living for 
Lord Jesus.